All right, we're going to go ahead and get this work session called to order this evening. Welcome and thank you all for coming. First, is there a motion to accept or modify the agenda? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, I make a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Is there a second? A second. All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, no. Thank you. Next up, we have the consent agenda. Is there a motion? I move that the consent agenda be approved as presented. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion on that? All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, no. Thank you. We're going to move to the action agenda this evening. So at our work sessions, um, I'll state what the item is. And then if there's anyone here from the public that would like to speak on that item for three minutes, you're welcome to come up and speak at that time. And then we'll have our presenters present on it. So our first item this evening is the second reading of policy JOAA, which is the camera policy in the classroom. Is there anyone here this evening that would like to speak on that? Okay, Mr. Smith. Good evening. Um, in order, this this policy is the second reading, uh, two of, of, of three readings, um, and this would be uh, classroom video um, policy J O A A. So, um, in order to protect the safety and security of students, employees, and authorized visitors in certain school uh, division classrooms, the board. A uh, school board may require video surveillance uh, in uh, all or designated classrooms. And from our last meeting, we outlined that there were nine areas that uh, I covered, and uh, I'll just briefly go over those so that we have an opportunity to discuss. Um, we talked about the uh, type of monitoring this would be, and this would be use of video cameras. Uh, in the, during the instructional day in all or designated classrooms, uh, the cameras would be capable of monitoring all areas of the classroom uh, and also would have the opportunity to uh, have an audio uh, as well. Uh, where the monitoring uh, would occur, it would be the, during the instructional day in the designated or all uh, classrooms as as if they if they have a, a camera, uh, the length of the time of which the video would be stored. There are some codes that uh, could affect this, but the school division would retain the video recording from a camera for at least three months after the date the video itself was recorded. Um, the custodian of the video footage, the principal or the principal's designee at the particular school. Uh, would be the, um, the the immediate custodian of the, the video camera. Um, when video uh, can be viewed, uh, if there's an incident that is uh, reported, uh, those type of things, uh, then the video would be reviewed. Uh, we also sp uh, spoke in regards to some of the pre-kindergarten classes or the self-contained special education classes that within a 90-day period, the principal or the designee would uh, be would uh, view at least a 15-minute segment of that video if no incidences um, uh, occurred or were re reported. Um, who can who can uh, who can view the video and and when? If there is someone that reports an incident, if it's a if it's a, a parent of a child or if there's an incident the parent uh, could view the video with the uh, the principal and or, or designee if there was a incident of which involved an employee the employee would have that opportunity as well if there was something that was in the endangerment of a child uh, if there was some uh, something that that would deal with the safety of the harm then uh, law enforcement would also could possibly could have the opportunity to view as well as uh, child protective um, services. Um, the next was the protection of student identities, and uh, the school division would take necessary precautions to conceal the identity of students who appear in the video recording but who are not involved in the uh, in the incident. Um, and normally this is done with like a, like a, a blur type face or those type of things that are put on there. You know, when can uh, social services or law enforcement uh, access or view the 
the footage, as I mentioned, if there is a threat to the health or safety of a student, and the video shows, uh, we can show the video uh, to a resource officer, law enforcement, or child protective uh, services. And then we also, as we read through the policy, we just did some definitions of what an incident uh, would, would identify. And an uh, incident means uh, raised suspicion by a teacher, a parent, or guardian of a child of bullying, abuse, or neglect of a child or harm to an employee of Warren County Public Schools uh, by an employee of the school division or uh, another student. Um, there is, we, do, we did mention earlier, the self-contained uh, special education classroom. And it's defined in our, in our uh, draft policy here as a classroom of which the school division uh, in which a majority of students in regular attendance are provided special education instruction. And then your classroom itself where we identify where the cameras would be just means any room at a school in the division in which instruction occurs on a regular or daily basis. There were some uh, changes within the, the, the draft policy from last time and I, I highlighted those and underlined those in red. There is one particular um, area that I did not highlight in, in red that should actually be. If you look at the very, look at page one, if you look at um, uh, three lines down from the very top, uh, it says uh, the school board may require video camera surveillance and all, and it stops. It should be. Uh, uh, designated or all classrooms are designated classrooms that was left out all the other changes as I watch back through the video from last time I think we made those changes in red and underlined them I just wanted to clarify something that I, I had a couple of questions about after the first reading <clears throat> excuse me and that's just that putting this policy into place is not us saying which classrooms at this time we're putting the cameras in. It's simply saying when or if cameras go into classrooms, this is the policy that's going to regulate how they're being used. I just wanted to clear. I think there was some um, yes, confusion that, on that following our first sure. reading. Exactly. Yes, that is correct. That is correct. That if if this was to occur, we would just want to have a policy in place and how to to, to implement that. So that's what this policy uh, would do. Um, well, my second one, just in reading it again, the periodic review of the recordings, I'm just wondering, we're saying if they're there, no less than 15 minutes for pre-K and self-contained classrooms, no less than every 90 days. So in 180 school, 180 day school year, we're saying we're gonna check it twice. I mean, that, that feels- well, that 90 it, school days or 90 days days? Well, I don't know. Every three months. It's like every, 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 every month. Like every three months. And my, my other question to kind of piggyback on that was, if I'm, if I'm reading this correctly, we're saying that that's only for the pre-kindergarten and self-contained classrooms. So let's say if we have a classroom that has, has a, cl a camera and there's no concerns, that camera will never, is that, it, it might, it's, it's the next sentence. Yeah. It says if there's a complaint or anything. If there's a complaint. But if there's... <coughs> So my question is, is if we have a, a classroom and there's never any incidences that whole year and we never check the camera, how do we know like they're not, there might not be a technical glitch and maybe that camera wasn't working for the last three months? Like I don't want us to get into a situation where um, there's a camera in a classroom and it's May, we've never had any concerns, you know, that I, I want no concerns obviously, but we but then we have to go look at the camera and we're like, oh, wait a minute, we've never checked it. So how do, you know, to see that it's working. So how will we ensure that it's actually working and there's not been a technical glitch? Uh, our technology that department sense? would have to monitor that. Yeah, it, it makes sense. <laughs> I mean, I just don't want us to get um, in a situation where we're like, oh, well, apparently the camera hasn't been working since September because we've never checked it for functionality. Right. You're talking about a maintenance check. Yeah, like, yeah, just for functionality. You know, because I mean, technology is great until it's not. <laughs> so I don't know if that even is a, I don't know how we address that, but I think it's an important piece, you know, to make sure if that, you know, any room that does have that camera potentially, that they are there serving their purpose. Um, and I wonder if 
if technology can, can review those, like pull up video from over the weekend or something just to see if they're. That's what I mean. They can look at video that's not during class. Yeah. Yeah, like just, yeah, pull it up like at every. 90 days like on a Saturday or something just to make sure that okay yep everything's running properly mm -hmm. I don't know I don't know what kind of issues we have with cameras you know if they go down a lot yeah I'm, I'm not sure how often uh, they go down um, periodically I'm sure they do go down I, I, I would not know uh, technology I could reach out to technology and, I, and I'm not sure if there is any type of alarm system or some type of system that would let you know that hey this camera's out yeah if it's down or off if it's right you know something in your car vehicle or something's wrong because you don't want to have a, a, a reported incident and go pull the camera and, like, and realize it's oh it it's hasn't been working correct because then yeah we're, we're not serving the purpose so right. okay. i'm just going to circle back to the 90 day thing do we feel like that is uh, frequent enough if if the reason to have them in pre-K and um, self-contained classrooms is that we're monitoring because we're having kids that can't tell what's going on is 15 minutes to make three it like months. once a month or three times a semester or once a quarter or anything. Well, that's what I'm just asking. Like, yeah. I, it feels like maybe it's not doing what it would be intended to do. Would it? We run on nine weeks with something like once in nine weeks to be the same as like how we run with our grading period. If you do once a quarter, once, yeah, year, once a quarter, that's four times a year. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be four times a year. Okay. Is that something? I mean, it feels a little better than yeah. just maybe twice a year. Well, and it's consistent because, well, I guess like, yeah, well, I mean, I guess 90 days would be consistent too, but still at least once a quarter. I think it's a little bit more specified. And it is in addition to the normal observations. And sure. Usually there's two sure. people in those rooms, sure. at least two staff, at least in the rooms. And, mm -hmm. I mean, it's supposed to be an additional mm -hmm. backup, not like the only thing. Okay. I don't know. I think once a quarter is fine, but if you all want to do more than that, I think once a quarter would be good. So the change there would be made uh, school no less than every 90 days to no less than once every quarter. And then you go, are you going to follow up with technology to kind of see about what that would look like? Right. Okay. Yeah, I will. We can talk about that next time. Well, like on Mark's camera, there's a little red light on there right now, so you know it's working. All right. So <coughs> hopefully there'll be some kind of indication, and then the classroom teacher could call and say, I don't see a, the green light or red light on my camera, you know. Next up this evening on the action agenda, we're going to have the approval of the 2023-24 Gifted Advisory Committee. Is there anyone here this evening that would like to speak on that? Good evening. Uh, on behalf of Denise Walton, who oversees the uh, gifted programming uh, for our students, I'd like to present the WCPS Gifted Advisory Committee for 2023-24. The governing regulations over gifted education services as well as our local plan for gifted education includes the establishment of this local advisory committee. Teachers on the committee are chosen by the principals and they either have endorsements in gifted education or they work with the gifted uh, students. And then the parents on the uh, committee all the parents of gifted students were sent an email and a form that they could complete if they were interested in serving on the committee um, and those were followed up with a couple of uh, reminders in order to submit that form in the case where a school uh, would have had two interested parents it's just done by like a random drawing so that there's one parent um, you know that represents represents the school um, the names are in the attached PDF um, and then I have one addendum, uh, a late teacher submission from Skyline High School.
the addition of Holly Natalie, uh, who is a teacher at the school, uh, to serve as their representative to the committee. And I can work with Rob to get the PDF updated. Um, any questions about the nominees or the process? For the three schools that don't have a parent representative, did no parent? No parent submitted a form. Any questions for Ms. Bragg? Is there a motion? I move, I move that the school board appoint the proposed nominees to the Warren County Public Schools Gifted Advisory Committee for the 23-24 school year with the addition of Ms. Natalie from Snellen High School. Is there a second? I'll second to Any discussion on that? All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, no. Great. Thank you, Ms. Bragg. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, moving into our work session this evening. First up, we have the Town of Front Royal and County of Warren Planning Department, and that's Lauren Kopisch and Matt Winkler. <coughs> And I'm going to actually them. be going over to the computer itself, though, okay? Because I don't have a PowerPoint. I'm working directly on okay. our plan. So, and it's been downloaded. Yeah. Yeah. So. I'll do is I'll kind of just take you through what a comp plan is, um, what our process was, and then just give you some information that I thought may be pertinent for the school board. Um, but basically, a comprehensive plan is a guiding document for the town, for the citizens, for developers, the community. Um, it basically uh, it addresses topics that deal with the built environment, and for us, this was the first time in about 10-15 years that um, we had really uh, taken a look at what this plan should be. So the state code requires that a, the comprehensive plan include a transportation plan with a map, um, a broadband plan that was, that's relatively new in the last uh, five, ten years it's been added, and then a chapter on affordable housing. Um, and then the rest of it is, is at our discretion. Um, and, but what this does is this outlines the goals and visions for the locality and this leads to changes in our zoning and subdivision ordinance. So one of the um, major accomplishments of this plan is, is we now have this new plan and it bookends with the new zoning and subdivision ordinance that we're currently working on writing. Um, and so let me get to, so our last plan that was completely adopted and rewritten was um, done in 1996 and then adopted in 1998, so a lot's changed in 25 years. We've had major technological advances. Um, and so while the town has, has provided some updates, especially back in 2008 when um, the Marshall planning area was annexed in, we had not overhauled the entire document in about 25 years. Um, so for us, a lot of years. And state code <laughs> requires basically that we look at it every five years, but it doesn't give us any guidance as to when do you completely rewrite it. So our planning commission and previous directors have all looked at it. It's just been a long time since we had a overhaul. Um, but basically, 
we look at you know where we are, so we establish a baseline, and then we start the data gathering and analysis portion. So that was the first couple of months, so from August of 2021 into about December of 2021, January 2022, we were just in the information phase. We looked at census data, we used um, Esri Business Analyst, um, we put out a community survey and we held a public open house um, just to kind of talk about you know, where are we have established our baseline. Um, we continued with the public outreach. We did not have a citizen advisory committee per se, but what we did was we used our Frida board, the planning commission, town council, board of architecture review. We used those boards and appointed officials as our advisory committees. Um, and then we, we developed the plan. So this just kind of gives you the actual dates, um, but in May of 2022, we actually had our first um, major you know, public input session. So this was two days where we had maps on, a, on tables and we had the public come in and basically put post-it notes on there and say, okay, this is what we want to see in, in this neighborhood. And these are our problem areas. This is where we think we need roundabouts. Um, this is where we want to you know, focus residential development. And that created the framework of the plan and the future land use map that came out um, last summer. And then in October of actually 2022 to December 22, that's when we had an additional final public open house. And then we had the final review um, this past May and it was adopted this past August. And so what we've started now is we have started the subdivision and zoning ordinance rewrite. And that, I'm hoping to have a draft by December or January and then hopefully get that adopted early next year. And the way our plan is organized is we have a vision. That sets the, that is the goal. That is what Perp Oil wants to be in the next 20 to 30 years. From that vision, we pulled out the big ideas. So for us, there were four ideas that jumped out. So preserve our history, create more of the charm that we love. Um, create a lifelong community. Perp Oil should be a place where people can live their whole life here, not you grow up here and then you can't afford to stay, so you go elsewhere, or there's not enough jobs, so you go elsewhere. Um, and then affordable housing, the state requires it, but we also have a responsibility to provide for affordable housing to our citizens. And then environmental access, Fort Royal is unique, in Warren County is unique in our, our natural resources, and so we've made an effort to protect it, at least in this plan. But then from these big ideas, we have core topics. So each of these core topics um, correlates to a big idea. And then from there, we created goals in each one. So what this does is it just, we're going from a, you know, a bird's eye view and we're getting more and more focused as we go throughout the plan. So one of our ideas, the small town character, we've got goal statements. And then we go into objectives and strategies. And that gets down to the how do we bring this goal to fruition, which then helps us bring that ultimate vision of what we want the town to be uh, into being. And what that did for each of those core topics, big ideas, is we created an implementation matrix. So at the back of the plan, we have 32, a 32 page matrix with um, a goal, with an action, with a responsible party, whether it be town council, whether it be staff, uh, Frida or Planning Commission um, and then we have a kind of a loose time frame of okay when do we start looking at this but it's basically created a giant checklist that council and um, the, the community can kind of move in the right direction so this is what I recommend council sets goals off of and then the other crucial part of the future land use map or sorry, the plan is the future land use map. So we have a current zoning map that dictates what uses are allowed and where, and it also dictates density. What this future land use map does is allows us to state which areas we want to direct growth. So for instance, up in um, north of Happy Creek, we have this darker yellow. We have that um, labeled as uh, neighborhood um, residential and that's a medium density uh, residential area so the intention there would be to allow um, single family multi-family duplexes townhomes apartments 
a mixture of housing types at a higher density than you would see in the light yellow areas. That's more of your single family or um, you know, like attached dwelling unit areas. Um, and anything in orange, we've changed that to a mixed use commercial. So this is where we start to look at, can we have residential uses integrated with commercial uses. This is These are areas that we want to focus redevelopment towards. And then keep in mind too, with the town, the town naturally is going to be more dense than the county. Um, and that helps one, preserve land in the county. Um, but the town is where the utilities are. And that's where, if residential growth is going to happen in our community, it, it makes sense for it to be in the town limits. And so what we've got are 15 planning areas. The plan then takes each of these planning areas and lays that future land use map over top of them. So then you can kind of see at a smaller scale what is intended for where. Um, and then within each of these areas, we have opportunities, challenges listed, and then action strategies. So this guides staff, developers, council, when making land use decisions. And so, and that's just a brief overview. This plan is online. It's on our planning department website. Anybody in the community can look at it for free. It's there. Um, but the next steps are the so subdivision and zoning ordinance rewrite. And where this is important is one, this brings the comp plan into being, but zoning is the strongest tool I have. So this is where at the parcel level. So the comprehensive plan is just the the overall view or direction that we want to go at the zoning level that's at the parcel level that's what's happening on the ground so that's where I determine is this use appropriate on this piece of property so if somebody comes in and they want to build townhomes in a single-family subdivision we say no because it's not permitted by way. Um, and so for the school board I think this is the most important part so in Front Royal we have approximately 8200 parcels so those are lots of pieces of property currently there are like 5400 or 5500 of them essentially are built out so they are already developed we have 2700 parcels that are vacant when you start looking at uses we have 6700 residential parcels 4700 of those are built out so we have 1900 parcels in the town of Front Royal that are vacant that can be used for residential uses that can be developed as housing um, that currently are not. Now some of those may not be buildable, some of them may um, not have utilities, they may be too narrow or have some type of constraint, there could be steep slopes, but that is just a rough estimate. And then um, in 20, what is it, 2008, that Marshall planning area in the northeast areas, those were annexed into the town. Um, if you look at just by right development outside of any current proffers or any rezoning requests, if you look at just the land area, you're looking at approximately 1,300 potential homes that could come in just off of the land area. Mind you, you'd have to, you'd probably lose about 15, 20% of that due to infrastructure development. But that's where I think um, it, it becomes important for you guys to realize that that's without a rezoning, that's, that's administrative processes. That's them coming into the planning and zoning department and building it and, and town council doesn't have any control over it. That's an addition to the 1900. Yes. Yeah. All right, and I can take any questions that's pretty much the end of mine. Well, and that's why we wanted to yes. just kind of get an update from you. Um, over the past six to eight months, we've had a lot of conversations about how full our elementary schools are and how close are we to needing a new elementary school. And so I think it's good for our community just to hear you know, what the growth potential is and to you know, hopefully be able to plan as a school division for those needs as they're gonna come to us. Because despite what's happening with the economy, I mean, we. We don't know for sure, but um, there has been a lot of interest in the vacant land uh, north of Happy Creek. And so 
what I think we're going to start seeing is if you do start seeing buy right development, you're looking at 40, 80, 100 homes at a time, you know, being built in a, in a frame of maybe two years. That there's there's no legislative process that's going to stop that. If they come in, they apply, and they meet our standards and state you know, standards for stormwater things like that. I, we can't just deny it. It's not us trying to encourage development that's unwanted. It's just that is the process. If they meet the standards, we have to approve it. The other part of that um, of interest to the school board is the town actively working to recruit any type of builder that does more affordable houses for our teachers, for our staff that want to stay. Is there anything go out and recruit? Right. It's, they come into our office, but um, as part of the zoning and subdivision ordinance rewrite, we can start looking at, you know, do our setbacks prohibit or make it more difficult to, to build something, um, to do like these affordable housing projects? Do we have standards in place that are making things more expensive, or do we have parking standards that are, are making it to where it, it's not feasible? Those are the things that we're starting to look at. So. I guess that's more what I meant. Are you doing yeah. things to try to make it a little more enticing for those type of yeah. projects? But what that'll mean is that, you know, in our new zoning um, code, we, we need to maybe loosen some of the standards on the apartments or condos, townhomes, things like that. Um, right now we have square footage minimums for lots that I think prohibit a lot of that type of development in town. Um, so that's just going to be at the that's going to be up to planning commission and town council as we work through these great changes. So much of it is driven by the market, and, and you know what? What's it worth to a builder to come in and buy a lot and build a single family home or a, a duplex, that kind of thing? Um, obviously, the town with its model of lots, um, you know, they live in a to those uh, smaller homes or smaller duplexes or duplexes, that kind of thing. But, um, you know, to really kind of identify the good, the good thing about the new comp plan for the town is they've got kind of a, a, a good handle on what uh, zoning is in the specific places and they can basically say, okay, so this is where we want to see these higher density multifamily units, that kind of thing, and this is where we can, you know, we can live with more of a single family uh, dwelling approach, that kind of thing. And so uh, it's, it's a really good guide for that and a good guide for developers coming in and you know, figuring out, well, where do I want to build a you know, six hundred thousand dollar home? You know, it's probably not gonna be in a town. You might be able to build something that's three hundred or four hundred, you know, who knows now, but um, you know, so they'll look at that and they can look at the county and see where they're at the potential there. But um, yeah, in the in the the next step for the town is that zoning ordinance where that zoning ordinance is going to be based on this comprehensive plan and those rules that are enforceable will be uh, applied and, and, uh, again that's kind of a whole nother uh, process and step and you know that may take some time but um, you know town's made really good headway on this and, you know, for not having a full-blown rewrite and plan after 25 years and you have to do this it's, it's uh, really kind of set them up in a good position for that next five year review. You know, where it's like, okay, let's see what kind of changes we have now. You know, and uh, I think that's, you know, that's got you guys now in a pretty good position. So. And I think an important next step, I don't know if you have the data, you know, how many kids on average are generated per household, but um, you, know, you can do GIS analysis and figure out per you know, school zone or how many vacant lots are there? Like, what is the potential for each school? I think one of the things that would be beneficial for, for both the town and county in regard to development is um, because of the nature of the economy changing and the cost of, of you know, having a kid, kids in school and that kind of thing. Um, for us, when we get a developer that comes in who may want to rezone, we're going to request a fiscal impact model. Okay, it'd be really nice to be able to have the, the, the county, the school board, have something already in place 
for that, you know, with the latest numbers, you know, for that school year, you know, how much, are the, how much enrollment do you have? What, you know, what are you going to need for additional classroom? What's the cost this year for, you know, per, per student? You know, uh, if your numbers are down, the cost might go up, that kind of thing. So for us to be able to have that tool, along with, you know, we would obviously, you know, try to get the fiscal impact model one for the other services that the county provides at that point. But, but to, have, to have that maybe budgeted with your annual budget where you just have, you know, maybe at the beginning of school year, end of the school year, you, you just have that fiscal impact model uh, run and then we could go to you and say, okay, what is your fiscal impact model for, you know, having, uh, that we could say to a developer, okay, what do you, you know, this is what we got, we would like to see, you know, proffers in the way of this and we would have that data readily on hand. So that's just the thought, you know. Um, because right now yeah. we had a fiscal impact analysis done that town did, and it stated that per unit, the capital cost per student was $5,600. So at that point, the developer comes in and says, okay, we'll pay $5,600 per household or per new unit to the schools that's to offset those costs. And that's based on the estimated cost we got from the school board or the county yeah. at what, $30 million for a new elementary school. So that analysis is only good as the data that we put into it. So if that's not an accurate number, then that cost or that proffer amount is not going to be <coughs> what you need. Yeah, and the other thing is, is, is if, if the amount of homes that they're bringing in is not going to Require, okay, this doesn't put us over to the point where now we have to look at doing a new school, but we may have to put an additional, we may have to, you know, add mobile classroom, whatever you all would do. You know, you would look at that cost and you could say, well, this is actually what it's going to cost us now per student with the additional amount of students that you potentially could bring in. And um, so it's, it's kind of almost like that data and those numbers are yours. We can only take it and then apply it to, you know, these projects and these planning projects. So it's helpful, you know, to you, for you, and the school board, and, and uh, the number of crunchers to be able to, uh, you know, have some kind of an annual fiscal analysis done. Um, just to have it readily available. So when we have these developers come in and say, well, we want to build a 156 square uh, a home development or whatever and we can say well this is this is what it's going to cost you for schools yeah we'll run the fiscal analysis for the for the other services in here so uh, and the majority of our vacant land is in that northeast portion of the town so that is happy creek shenandoah shores uh, leach run parkway that area yeah. and i'll talk a little bit about that in my presentation i kind of want to just kind of tie you into that so uh, how about if i step over you Pretty much. Yeah, any, any more questions? Yeah, I, I do. Can yeah. you def I know a few years ago <coughs> the regulations on proffers were changed. Can, can you bring us up to speed on that? Well, let's put voluntary proffers in front of that because they are voluntary. Okay. Um, yeah, basically, from what I what I know is that for commercial and industrial development. Um, we can request proffers, especially proffers that are applied directly to the impact of the development. Now, uh, if you have a warehouse or a distribution center going in, we're not going to be able to ask them for proffers for the schools because that's not a direct uh, impact, okay? Um, but if you have a planned residential development, it's kind of a whole other story. Okay, especially, and, and proffers can only done be done during rezones, okay? Um, so, uh, I think that the state rules were that we had to just be very careful about asking for proffers uh, for the plan residential yeah, developments, so, and you can help me out a little bit yeah, with so that. So, in, yeah. I think it was 2016 is when we had the first major legislation change, um, and then there was another change in 2018. I believe, um, but essentially it stated that there has to be rough proportionality and there has to be an essential nexus, meaning that the impact, the 
proffers are there to offset the direct impact of the development, and it can't be, it can't exceed the actual impact of the development itself. So that's the, you know, if somebody comes in and they want to build a hundred homes, um, and by right development would have been 40, you're looking at the impact over and above what you had a responsibility to initially provide for. So if you have to provide for your schooling or accommodations for 40 homes worth of students, but now there's an additional 60 units that you need to figure out how you do this, that's what we can ask for, proffers for the offset cost of. But it's rough proportionality and the essential nexus. It's got to be related and it's got to be tied to the actual impact above and beyond what you would have already had to do. Most applicants will submit a community impact statement which will identify you know, the services that they're going to be needing for that specific use. Okay, and so, uh, you know, in commercial, industrial, we do have cash proffers that uh, developers provide for North Ward Fire Department in tent because that's going to be a, uh, the fire and rescue that's going to serve that area of the corridor. Uh, so, um, yeah, but as, as uh, Lauren said, usually it, it, it can't be above, you know, you're not going to ask somebody to build a school for you and they got to be. You know, 60 additional homes, you know, so. But it's good to have the numbers there. So when Lauren's meeting or I'm meeting with someone and they're looking at doing something like this, um, we can tell them this is what you can expect. This is what, you know, it takes to have, you know, a student, you know, put a student through school in one county, you know. And I hate to say it, but most of them will low volume on, on the voluntary sure. offers. <laughs> So I'm not saying kind of up them, but definitely make sure that you have a, a fair, you know, cost on that per student cost. You know. That's what becomes a trade too. Yeah. Because yeah. we can't ask them yeah. to up that amount, yeah. and especially us in the town, because we do not oversee the schools. Yeah. It's even more difficult for us yeah. to say you yeah. need to do this. Yeah. So I was going to ask, are there established guidelines for calculating that, or it's just kind of whatever we say? To, prior to 2016, we used to have what you call the proffer schedules, and basically when a developer would come in, you could show them a list, okay, here's typically what you need to pay for streets, schools, it was all broken down. That's why the legislation was changed, they, were, they basically called it the developers is how they phrased it, and yeah, they changed there it. There was some abuse so. of it in, in yeah. some of the larger more fluent you know, in the <coughs> state. So um, I know we, we just, in the past, I'm, I'm just aware that we would have a fiscal impact model done and, uh, based on any applications. That and when they apply, at least to the town, that's one of our requirements. They have to submit an, an environmental impact assessment, but they also have to submit a fiscal impact assessment, and that is supposed to give us kind of a breakdown of yeah. how their development is going to impact the town. And when we get something, it gets routed to the county, and then the county does a review Yeah, we well. got fire and rescue, we've got parks and rec, those kind of things. So there might be pieces that, you know, plain residential development may impact and say, look, well, we can, we can contribute some of this to this, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, it's just a, it's a, a delicate cakewalk, so to speak, with, uh, with these. But um, it's really important because when you do have development come in, they are going to impact. The challenge that the county has is we have an ordinance for that allows for um, uh, age-restricted 55 and above active adult communities. And active adult communities don't technically have children coming into the school system. You know, they may have grandchildren, they come and stay or whatever, but technically that. So it's it's a bit of a challenge for us because we can't really ask for any money from the school system. And, you know, so, and it's a buy right use. You know. So, um, you know, they, the public services that serve communities like that are more your emergency uh, uh, fire and rescue and emergency services. So, those are kind of things we might get uh, some problems for um, in parts of the but, uh, anyway, so. um, Let me just go over the computer here real quick. And that's kind of where I have my stuff. And I'll, 
Uh, sorry, I didn't get a PowerPoint, nice PowerPoint like Lauren, but uh, so I'll uh, I'll start just really with um, with this. Uh, I brought this with me. This is the Happy Creek Road Shred Final Report, done January 27, 2005 just before I started with the county. <laughs> and uh, it actually uh, talks about the area that Lauren was pointing out in her uh, uh, comp plan in the Happy Creek Corridor, uh, where they did kind of a lot of uh, citizen input, very much like they did with the comp plan, and addressed uh, issues there, transportation issues, future development issues, what the zoning issues were. And I marked a couple places here in this. And it just so happens that they have a draft master plan and they actually show uh, an area that a school could be provided uh, in, that, in that plan if it was to be uh, built out. Um, another uh, one of the public facilities and services, it says foster long-term development of two school sites and one major active park within the planning area in general accord with concept plan, local standards for such public facilities. Land for such public sites is expected to be proffered by rezoning applicants to assist in mitigating the impacts of the, pro of the projects. Uh, we can look back, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the notes in this is that it uh, states for their, their draft con conceptual plan, uh, schools and public use sites about 90 acres out of that one big parcel that was annexed into the town uh, which is about four percent of the total study area and um, and then lastly the county's comprehensive plan calls for a draft uh, growth management strategy that will uh, guide new residential development to locations where adequate public infrastructures such as roads water schools sewer and related facilities are available or can be provided most effectively. Well, in the 20 years since this came out, one school has been built. A Leach Run Parkway has been built. Uh, phases one and three or four of Happy Creek Road has been done. Um, there have been some applications for planned residential development, uh, some denied by the uh, council, uh, the county, did annex, uh, I think it was about 600 acres, is that 604 acres into the town specifically to direct higher density development into that area. Uh, that kind of ties into our, let me just get this here. Okay, I wish I just okay. He downloaded it into the. Let's see, no, it's not that one. It's um, on your probably. Uh, on the agenda. It might be on the agenda, or it's you want to show us where you put that there? Yeah, it's just right, right here in the uh, Sorry. middle nice. floor. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. So. So we have um, here, what I brought up is the, oops, sorry, this is why I guess uh, PowerPoints are good, because you can, um, our urban development area map. Um, the state requires, required that, and this is about 2013, that counties and municipalities look at identifying areas areas in the communities that had that were served by public sewer or water and public roads uh, it was a way to uh, avoid having to sprawl the county you know um, large developments being built far away from populated areas which then would require roads to be built to serve those areas and provide you know and, and cost the state more as far as maintenance, as far as building of roads. Um, 
and also, you know, the public infrastructure. You have a public infrastructure there of sewer and water. Uh, and that was 2018. We reviewed that. We went over that with the town. Um, that's in our code uh, section four. And this is kind of like the important thing about um, the, uh, the comp plan now that you have for the town is it, you know, it identifies these areas in the north part and that we have here uh, for the higher density development. Okay, we want to put the houses there. Uh, there's not a need to really build roads. So yeah, they're going to improve some of the roads, but those plans are in place already. Um, the sewer and water, it's already being provided to those areas. So, um, you know, this is uh, an integral part of our, our comp plan. And in 2013, that was part of what we adopted into uh, that as a part of our review. Um, we did a review in 2005 when I started, that finished. And then we started in 2010 for our, another review. It took us about three years. Uh, right now, the county has done a strategic vision. And let me go to that. Okay. I'm probably going to get. I don't do pads, these pads very well, so just bear with me. So we did a strategic vision here in 2018, and um, we did a survey for the community. We asked a bunch of questions. We ran it for, I think it was about six months. Ago, so it was a while. Gave people adequate time to kind of put their input, and um, brought that with me. Just wanted to point out a couple of uh, areas in uh, in, the, in the strategies area. Uh, we identify an area for uh, education and some of the priority levels that we had. Some of the, the questions that we had was increased teacher pay and benefits. The levels needed to retain the best teachers in the northern Shenandoah Valley and attract teachers from adjacent counties. Uh, another high one was huge retention bonus, beginning at a year four to retain the best teachers. Uh, medium uh, priority level was to defray school expansion costs through proffers. It's something that we can do through the planning process. And then um, another moderate was coordinate expansion and improvement of school facilities with new private development proposals. Okay. Um, we also had some other questions that we, we, uh, we put out there, and again, this was, uh, this was a number of questions relating to the community, but relating to the school system and education was, um, some of the questions were coordinated expansion and improvement of school facilities with new private development proposals, and defray those costs uh, through proffers. Again, we kind of going over that, and then they, they prioritized it. And so we put that all in, and these are things that what we'll do is we'll use those in updating the comp plan now, in, the, in our review of the comp plan now. Where we are now with comp plan, our uh, COVID kind of put us a little bit <laughs> behind. We got things started, and then we had a uh, change of board members and some changes of uh, planning commission members. So in 2022, we did a review of our comp plan with our, our, our uh, planning commission members. And then this year, we've worked with the Regional Commission on providing us and doing some data mining for our economic development chapter and our uh, demographics uh, chapter in the comp plan. And uh, that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, we've had a lot of other things going on. Uh, the county has not outsourced this other than using the Regional Commission to assist us with some of that data mining and whatnot. So, um, we are looking for, and we'd love to hear comments from the uh, school board and, and, and uh, 
members of the community as to what are some good ideas, what are some things you'd like to see in this comp plan uh, review that we have. Uh, the comp plan is available online. Let me go to that real quick. I'll show you where we uh, are. Uh, uh, This opens it up. Okay. Are you trying to get them online? I'm just trying to, actually, I'm just trying to open up a PDF. Oh, the web website there? Yeah, you can open it up the PDF. Okay. If you want to do that, one of the things you can do is do. I have a snap uh, screenshot of it. Okay. Well, we did review it. So, yeah, in the planning department, uh, there we go. Um, so this is uh, this is our planning department. This is our comprehensive plan, and you would just go to government, pull down uh, planning, and then in the planning uh, uh, section on the left there is the comprehensive plan, and that breaks our comprehensive plan down to all of its chapters uh, and maps and tables, our vision, that kind of thing, and. Um, yeah, it's a great resource. Uh, you'll see the UVA map that I, I brought up. And, um, you know, we just, uh, again, it's a review this time, but we want to refine it. And maybe we'll, 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 uh, we'll certainly update it with uh, things that have changed in the past. Well, it's been 10 years now. Yeah. So, so we'll do that. But um, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Uh, Appreciate your again. We really appreciate y'all inviting us tonight. I do have one. Sure. Are you guys in planning department um, between the two? Are you tracking the birth rates because a child born today is going to start kindergarten in a few <coughs> years? And uh, I know that building is different because um, a subdivision could be built out in two years and have. 50 kids going to school, but the birth rate is a pretty reliable statistic, what we can see for four or five and six years from now. Are you all tracking that? Weldon Cooper is a really good resource for uh, population birth, uh, population uh, data. So we do utilize them. Uh, we, we use the decennial uh, census data from 2020. We Using some of that data as far as that mining, there's a, a number of uh, state resources that we can utilize for some of our uh, economic development data. But uh, I would say probably the census is one of your primary ones. Um, we yeah. don't have a mechanism. And you track that? Yeah. I mean, in, internally, that we can. But um, we use outside resources. So, um, yeah, that's the challenge that we. We have when you have a small staff, you know, and you're doing a million other things, <laughs> yeah. But uh, the regional commission has been very helpful in that regard in doing some of that data mining for us and providing us with that. And we've actually come to the school board uh, at times for enrollment numbers, annual enrollment numbers, which we include uh, in our information. Um, we had for a while there been doing a community uh, profile uh, form that we to businesses and people coming into the county. Um, I don't know if it's been a little while since we stopped doing that. Um, I don't know if that's something we're going to resume, but I know we had some school numbers in that uh, community profile. And, uh, so we might want to look at doing that, you know, and then on an annual basis, then you can kind of see those numbers and how they change. So, again, thank you very much. Appreciate you all. Uh, having us this evening. Is there a track that's identifying for the next elementary school? Is there a track of land that's identifying for the next elementary school? I don't know. I don't think there is a track of land that's identified. That I'm on a property or FL partnership. In the property, I think they set aside land. Yes. Um, and that's part of that 604 acres that was annexed in. And I know he's got another, what, 300 acre truck? Yeah. No, 
he's got a ton of land. And, and, and that's kind of where that charrette ties into, is we look at that conceptual plan that they had in the charrette, and we kind of apply it to that area. And that, that conceptual plan called for the two, two schools. So we have the one now, and there's potential in that area. Um, in the north area of the county, that Rockland area, it's just density is not high enough. Just, we want to focus things, if you would want to do it, would be the periphery or within uh, the town. Is, I would say. Okay. Cost of transportation, that kind of thing. Uh, remember, I'll just mention this. I didn't show you the, uh, our zoning map, but 60% of the county is still an agriculturally zoned property. Okay? So uh, we have limited amount of subdivision rights now as we kind of move further away from our... And you need to keep yeah. that to maintain the agricultural nature of the county. Right, what right. you're going to start seeing is more sprawl yeah. creeping into the rural areas, the older rural areas. Yeah, one of the ways that we, we are looking at trying to help people in the community because the challenge that we have right now is the development of, of some of these town properties just not getting done is uh, county, uh, we do have an ordinance going through that will allow two additional family subdivision of land uh, from a parent parcel as it existed in 1977. So this would allow families to have, uh, give land to their kids or, you know, uh, the parents say, okay, uh, you can have a house and I'll I'll build me a nice little one level home there and, and allow them. So we'll see some the you know some of that happen and the development will be spread across the county instead of intensified like you would have in the county. So it's just one tool. All right. Well thank yeah, you very thank much. You. We appreciate it. Thank you. Next up this evening we have uh, discussions with representatives from the Phoenix project. If you guys would like to come up. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. My name is Kristen Gregg. I'm the child advocate at Phoenix Project. I'm, I work with kids who have either experienced directly or have witnessed domestic violence. We want to have this not happen, obviously. The way that we do that is through primary prevention, and that is through educating children, um, which incidentally is has overlap with um, the state of Virginia's law on family life that you that you teach. And I'm going to just bring you this to pass around if you want to take a look. It's an example of the curriculum. There are three targeted age ranges, but it spans from pre-K all the way up through high school. The idea being that should these the same students are worked with throughout um, their education. So we're not only addressing prevention of abuse, uh, we're also addressing just how to look for red flags in relationships, green flags, how to be healthy peers, how to be uh, empowered bystanders, bullying prevention, um, how to not abuse others, that's, that's critical, how to be responsible, healthy community members and how to just foster an environment of support and peace. We take care of each other, and we're educated about our bodies, our boundaries, so that we are less likely to be violated. Um, so if you look at, and it'll kind of, we'll kind of go around, but um, this particular curriculum, so I'm trained in an evidence-based curriculum produced by Prevent Child Abuse Vermont. Um, and this curriculum is also being studied by the CDC. So it's, it's pretty hefty and has caught the attention at, at a national level. Uh, there is a map in there showing all of the areas of the United States that are currently using this program. This program is 
very well researched, studied. Um, there are, let me just bring this over. Don't feel like you need to look, this is a lot, but just I want you to have it so you can kind of see the results of studies that have been done there. Um, so this isn't, this isn't a new thing. This is very well researched. It does address Virginia's um, child sexual abuse component of the family life law, but actually in reading the law, um, it gets at much, much more of it, not just uh, the prevention of sexual abuse. It would start with um, younger kids, pre-K. That program is called Care for Kids. And you can kind of get an idea of the curriculum. Would anybody like to see an example of the curriculum? Just, Just to kind of... Is there a way for us to have copies of it for after our after session? Well, I can leave or you... Like these folders that yes, you those are free. Those. You have okay. those. Um, these are, right now I have one. Yeah. We're hoping to change that, right? We want every school to have these programs. I'm prepared to come in and serve whatever needs that you have. If you want us to come in once, twice, I can do that. My recommendation is that the full program be followed because it's most effective if we do it that way. Um, and. I can do this myself, that limits, you know, how many schools one person can get to, or, and, some combo, um, I can, I'm trained to train other people, other adults, teachers who are already in the schools, how to incorporate this curriculum into maybe a class that they're already teaching. Um, so there's that as well. That I would really like to see that happen and to see my role be more of a kind of overseeing all of that and a support role. Support groups, getting together to check in. How is this going in your classroom? What are your challenges? What, what do you need from us? How can we help you? Um, and just ongoing education. As laws change, and they do, um, we can adapt. We can adapt it. By no means do we have to cover every part of everything. We have to be realistic and um, serve the community that we're in effectively so we can adapt the program to suit the needs of the most people. Um, yeah, so that's the first one is care for kids. And then it goes into the elementary age with We Care Elementary. And then middle school age with this Safe Tea, which I can do. Does anybody just want to pass quickly, take a flip through? Um, and then there's another one for high school as well. Get an idea. I think we're missing the elementary. Um, kind of get an idea of what what the curriculum covers and I mean really covers every element of this family life education um, that is required I've also included the CDC study that has begun on the program they are I believe they have two more years left it's going to be a four-year study by the end of it so pretty thorough um, already positive reception of this program. And then toward the back, you're going to see um, how the program, you know, here's the data. Here's how the students are receiving the program. Here's how the parents are receiving the program. The teachers, what they have, their feedback about the program as they're delivering it. And I think this is also part of that family life law. This is a collaborative program. It, we want to involve parents as much as possible uh, and get them to buy in to the safety of their children, the health of their community. 
so it's there's a lot of data on how parents have um, taken to the program and I kind of just they consider this as you know step one here's the the presentation um, I can provide as much information as you need going forward um, and really just maybe a good time to pause here and ask what how you see your needs what are your needs who are you currently working with with this curriculum people that come to you individually or that are referred to you so I certainly can this is a new program for us even for you yes um, so I would I can do it individually it's of course You're much more effective though I'm sorry You're not currently no, I'm not. That, 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 you right. Know, you work with people that come to you, though. Currently. That's what we yeah, want to change. And to keep doing that work, it's incredibly important work. But it's, you know, we're, we're kind of addressing the problem after the problem has happened. We want to get in there and prevent it from happening at all. Um, and just beyond trouble prevention, actually building positive self-concept, positive body image, positive relation, positive relationships, being responsible in your community. So, so <coughs> what teachers would be involved in teaching this curriculum? I know your health and PE people are different programs, uh, like I taught family life uh, in, in, in Fauquier County, and we did Too Good for Bullying and Too Good for Drugs with the Mendez Corporation, and students had a workbook, and we could track what, what they were doing. Um, is this something similar, or which teachers would be involved? Is there a social studies teacher that's going to hit some of this curriculum, and how is that I think that's even shared in the building? I think that's up to the board. I mean, my recommendation would be probably a health class because I think this speaks to health. It is physical health, social emotional health, uh, peer to peer relationship health. Um, but that's that's something that is flexible. Okay. Yeah. So I saw that, um, like for example, for care for kids, it's like pre-K to second grade. Is the idea that they would have, and it's six lessons. Is that is the idea they would have those same six lessons every year in pre-K through second grade, or like once in that range, and then they would get the other one once in that three or four grades? Yes. So we wouldn't be repeating the same lessons uh, that they had in kindergarten and first grade. So they would have it maybe in kindergarten and third grade. And, and then you yes, and you're you're just. You're kind of adding on, solidifying what you've already built as um, their ages change and different things become age appropriate that were not age appropriate before, but then they've got that foundation there to just build on. Have you had any conversations with our counselors at this point? That are I have not. I can speak to in the past, we've worked very closely with the school systems we have come in and did a safe, safe dates program. Um, that was during gym class and um, that worked really well. We also have in the past went into the schools and worked with individual students who um, either their parents have indicated that that would be helpful um, and so we are able to go to them and work with them. So this is just another step in that. There was with, of course, COVID, Kind of put a halt to everything and so since then we have been researching and coming up with programs that would be the most beneficial um, and this is this is one that we we've studied and are trained for and that can be implemented with other adults too so which is why this mm -hmm. one speaks to to reaching the most students in the quickest round for them. And so at no cost. Right. To the, at no cost to the, <laughs> to the yeah. school system. Um, in different counties, a call, you know, it's been a while um, since I was in school systems, but I, I used to contract with an agency that 
taught a specific piece of family life in Warren, Clark, and Frederick. And so they contracted and the school board actually paid them to come in and do programs much like this. And, and this is at no cost to the school board or the schools in general. And so I, I think with what we are seeing, the rising incidence of domestic violence and sexual assault and bullying, there has got to be a point in which we stop just covering the wound and really start to get underneath of changing those social norms. But thank you. So Are I there? would that Ms. Bragg put a thing together since she's a little instruction um, and that Ms. Bragg set up a meeting and, and, and she can develop a team that you know, from the school which could be uh, include principals, tax counselors, uh, other central office staff, and then they meet, go over the program, review the program, um, and then try to see what we can do as far as implementation. If that's what the board would like, I think that that would be the direction to move. That's what I was going to suggest as the next step. I think that sounds great. Yeah, I'd be interested in hearing how that might work with our staff. So thank you for that. Thank you for coming. You need these back, right? Uh, I do. You need these back. Um, would it be helpful for you to have that? Well, I can give these to Miss Bragg. Okay, absolutely. Spiral stack. Okay. 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 discussion with the Warren County Department of Social Services. John Marks and I am the director of the Warren County Department of Social Services. I'm going to take a moment to introduce some of my staff members here. The people who actually do the work, who should get all the credit for it. This is Christy Lawson, our assistant director. Uh, also April White, who is our family services manager. Hello. And this is Amy Shadrick, who was one of our benefit program supervisors. Uh, they, have, they are the ones who have the answers to all of your burning questions. I want to thank you for the opportunity to meet with you tonight. And we just came to share some information with you, let you know who we are, what we do, and more importantly, how you can contact us or refer people for the services that we have. Uh, we do have a, uh, have a little PowerPoint presentation for you, if I can hit the right arrow. So I want to talk a little bit about the eligibility programs that we have, or the management programs that we have. Uh, you've probably heard about them, and about how much you know about them. SNAP is our Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. It used to be called food stamps, we don't call it anymore, we call it SNAP. Uh, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. The program is designed to help people who are of lower income, help them afford a few more groceries than they might have uh, otherwise. It's not a program designed to feed an entire family for an entire month. Uh, it is simply, um, it, and it can be used like cash, you get an EBT card, and it helps you purchase groceries. It's to augment your diet. Um, you can also, there are some, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, farmers markets mm -hmm. that uh, do take SNAP as well. And actually, if you work with a farmers market, you would say, okay, I want $20 uh, from my SNAP card. They would give you $40 worth of credit to purchase fresh fruits and vegetables from any farmers market as well. So uh, that's a wonderful part of the SNAP program. Uh, we also have child care assistance. Uh, 
for those who are in our TANF program or who are just working and have kids and can't afford child care. I don't know if you've looked at the child care prices recently, but I didn't pay that much to go to college um, for some of the tuition for, for child care these days. And so our fee-based uh, child care program is where uh, if you're under a certain income, we can assist you uh, paying the high cost of child care with child care facilities who work with our program. Not every child care facility does. Um, energy assistance, right now we're in our crisis our, I'm sorry, our fuel season, uh, low-income households can help get, help pay the, the light bill. Uh, or right now our fuel program, however you heat your home, whether it be through oil uh, or through electricity, if you qualify, you can get some assistance uh, paying that light bill. We want the lights to stay on, we want the heat to stay on this time of year especially. It's getting cold out there. Uh, and so these are some of the programs that we have running right now. Temporary assistance for needy families, that's our TANF program. You may know it as welfare. We, don't, we changed the name about 1996, and uh, it's temporary assistance as cash payment. You have to have a child in order to be eligible for this program. You also have to have pretty much no income to be able to qualify for this program. Um, there is a work component to this program. If you qualify for TNF, you get referred to our VIEW program, which is the Virginia Initiative for Education and Work. Um, the goal of every single one of our programs is to help people overcome poverty and uh, be self-sufficient. Uh, every single program that we have in the Department of Social Services has those goals in mind. Um, TANF is also time limited. Uh, you can only get it for a certain amount of time in your lifetime. Those are federal regulations. Um, we talked about our view program. Medicaid is our biggest program by far. Um, last year we had about 14,000 of the 40,000 Warren County residents uh, as our clients. And 11,000 of them had Medicaid. Uh, it's the insurance program. Uh, during the pandemic, they changed the regulations as to who um, could remain on Medicaid. Normally, you have to have a renewal every year to make sure you're still eligible. They waive that. And so our Medicaid rules are artificially inflated right now. Uh, Amy can tell you we're going through and doing a redetermination on all 11,000 Warren County residents who had Medicaid, and we are expecting at least 20% to no longer be eligible for Medicaid. Uh, that's a large amount. That's over 2,000 people who have insurance and may not have it when the redetermination is over. Because now we're back to have to meet the federal regulations uh, for Medicaid. Uh, there are many different kinds of Medicaid. Uh, there is, I just listed a few here, Medicaid, the Children's Health Insurance Program, or CHIP, you've probably heard of that. Um, there's special Medicaid for pregnant women, our age, blind and disabled Medicaid, our basic families and children Medicaid, our long-term care. Amy does a lot of work with our age, blind and disabled long-term care. So how do you apply for these benefits? Um, we always tell people, I can't tell you if you're going to be eligible without an application. So please put in an application. Make us do our job. Um, we're not going to answer a hypothetical, well, I earn this much. What am I going to be eligible for? I can't tell you because these programs are 15,000 pages worth of regulations that we have to go through. I can't tell you without an application, so please apply. It's easy to apply. You can apply online through Common Help. It's um, commonhelp.virginia.gov. Uh, and there's actually part of the Common Help program. You can put in your information and it can tell you what programs you may be eligible for. Um, you can call the numbers here, 855-635-4370, uh, and apply right over the phone and take your information and they'll send us your application. Uh, you can apply for Medicaid over the phone. You can come to our office and say, I'd like a paper application. We'd be happy to sit down with anybody and help them fill out an application. You can call our office and say, mail me an application. We'd be happy to do that as well. We even tell us that I'd like an application, but I can't get to your office. I'll bring it to you. We'll sit down with you. We'll help you fill out the application. Uh, 
you can also print a copy of the application at the DSS website, uh, dss.virginia.gov. So many different ways to apply. Um, it is pretty simple to apply. The applications can look daunting sometimes. Uh, a few years ago, we went paperless, and our Medicaid renewals went from five pages to 20. Uh, so we love our paperwork, but honestly, for all I need for an application is a signature on it. We can help you fill out the rest of the information. One thing I can't do is write your signature, um, but it's easy to apply. And then we have 30 days, up to 30 days to process any SNAP or TANF application, unless you're expedited, which is seven days, and 45 days for Medicaid, because sometimes we need, do need to get some verifications uh, with those. That's how long we have to process them. It doesn't mean that's how long it should take to process them. Um, our goal is as soon as we have the information we need to process the application, it should be processed. Um, get it off your desk. We talk a lot about numbers in our business, but as our people here can tell you, when I talk about numbers, what am I really talking about? People. Talking about people. If we're processing Medicaid or SNAP applications at 80% timely, that means one out of every five families didn't get dinner last night or aren't going to be able to fill their prescription at the pharmacy. So just because we have a certain amount of time to process doesn't mean that's how long it should take. Our goal is to process everything quickly and accurately to get the people who really need the help help in an expedited manner. Here's some more information on Common Help. Um, there's a link on the PowerPoint. I did send it to you, Dr. Ballinger. I'm sure you can send it out to everybody. Um, please share that information. Share that link with everybody. Um, all you have to do is click on it. It'll ask you the questions that you need to answer. It'll guide you through. Uh, the system is going to take a minute <laughs> because government websites take forever to pull things out, right? Um, but please don't hesitate to apply. Tell everybody, apply for these services. If this is something that you need, it's something that you may be eligible for, go ahead and put the application in. All it does is take a little bit of time. But that's not all we do. Uh, we have a whole other side of our building, which we call the services, and that's where uh, Ms. White Smart Murphy, side. <laughs> um, fit in. You probably know us best for Child Protective Services. Um, if we have a child who has been alleged to have been abused or neglected, we get a phone call. And uh, assessing and investigating alleged child abuse and neglect, that's what our CPS folks are there for. Uh, providing families with support and education. I could go in depth, um, probably, hopefully correctly, and she would correct me if I'm wrong, about what the process really looks like. But and suffice it to say, there are two different ways. If we get a report that meets the state criteria of abuse and neglect, and that's important to know, it has to meet certain criteria, and those criteria are what they will. I'm sure Dr. Ballinger, who was listening with bated breath at my last one, <laughs> um, there's four criteria for validity. One, has to be a kid, has to be under 18, at the time of the report. Now that doesn't mean if you're over 18 then we're not going to take it and give it to somebody who can do something about it, but for us to do a response you have to be under 18. The abuse or neglect has to occur in Warren County or they have to live in Warren County, we have to have jurisdiction. The abuse or neglect has to be um, precipitated by a caregiver. So if the neighbor does something horrible to a kid, that's a crime and the police will be involved, it may not be a CPS response. And the biggest one is it has to meet the definition of abuse or neglect as um, outlined by the Code of Virginia, the Administrative Code. Not what I personally would think would be poor parenting or neglectful behavior, but it would actually have to meet that, that, code, that legal standard. Now, thanks to Dr. Ballinger, every single school in our school district had a presentation from Ms. White before the school, this school year started on uh, mandatory reporting. What should you report? How should you report it? What should that look like? What information do we need? Um, and uh, you went to pretty much every school. I went to every school. I did one in here for diversified minds and answer roads. I'm sorry about what happened at Warren County High School with the projector. I don't know what happened. It just exploded. <laughs> <Pull> it up. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I have had some good feedback from people. Part of my presentation is that if you're not sure and you have questions, call me. And I have had calls from teachers and other administrators. And the bottom line, what we tell everybody 
is if you ask yourself, I don't know, should I report this? Yes. That's the answer. If you ask yourself, should I report it or not? Yes. Report it. Let us figure it out. The more information you can give us, the better it's going to be. Because if you say, well, Tommy came to school and um, his clothes were dirty and he looks tired. That's probably not going to be. That's not enough information. We need more information. April's favorite phrase that she tells me is, as evidenced by what? You know, give us as many details as you can. It helps us screen things in and make some value. APS. Um, just like CPS, but for our adults in the community. Um, age over 60 or age 1859 with a disability. Um, we have an APS department. Uh, Brenda Norman is our supervisor. She does a wonderful job uh, working with our older community as well. But there's more. Um, we have a permanency unit, foster care. Uh, right now, we have 39 kids in foster care. That may not seem like a lot, February we had 19. So since yeah. February, 20 kids have come into foster care for a bunch of different reasons. One kid is a lot. Yeah, one kid's None too big. should be there. Yeah. Uh, so our foster care workers, we try to make sure that they have um, placement as close as possible. We do work with our school partners. If we have to uh, place a child out of the community, they do best interest determination to make sure that the child has access to education. Um, you know, we, the office that we work with is just, you know, uh, wonderful to work with. Shamika back there helps us out a lot as well. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of local foster homes. Most of the kids that we have don't live in Moore County when they're in foster care. We are actively recruiting foster parents. If you know anybody who's interested in becoming a foster parent, please reach out to our office. Kids need to stay in their locality. The odds of um, returning home are far greater if they're still here in Warren County. These kids have been through enough. Um, they don't need to be uprooted and you know, live in Richmond or live in Northern Virginia. Uh, they need to be here with their friends, their support system, their school, their teachers. Um, so we are in desperate need of foster parents. Right now, I think we have three local homes right now. Yes. Um, so we are Everywhere we go, we uh, encourage people, if you're interested, please reach out to us. We'll walk you through the process. We'll tell you everything you need to know. Uh, our in-home prevention, uh, I am happy to tell you that um, we're one of the first agencies in the state who are actually focused on in-home prevention. Uh, I heard it in a couple other presentations earlier, um, and our friends from the Phoenix Project uh, talked about we want to get to the issue before it becomes a problem. Prevention is the key. If we can get into a home before a child is abused, we can prevent that CPS call from coming. Uh, so we have uh, two workers who do in-home. It's a pretty new program here in the Commonwealth. Uh, but like I said, we were focusing on it before. April is the one the supervisor who started the program. I am. Uh, and it, it's a completely voluntary program. Uh, one of the things that we do here is that we get a CPS call and it doesn't meet validity criteria. But I'm still concerned. It's still an issue. We send them a letter saying, hey, we got a call. Is there something going on? Can we come out and talk to you? Can we provide services to you? Um, can we help hook you up with uh, different community services out there? And we're getting a response rate of what? It doesn't... I'm the math genius, but I was hoping to get 20%, two out of every 10 people. But the last time I checked, the numbers were getting about 40%. Yeah. And so people are recognizing that, hey, we're not the bad guy, we're out to help you, we're trying to hook you up with resources. So we have in-home workers who can go out and just say, talk to me, tell me what's going on, what are your needs, how can we connect you with other community services? So how do you make a CPS or an EPS? Call, call our office, 95, um, extension 3333, that'll, you'll talk to our intake worker, her name, her name is Molly. Um, after hours, you can call the Virginia State Hotline. I highly recommend you only do that if you have about five hours to kill, because you'll be on hold for a long time. There's 120 hotline workers for the entire Commonwealth. 
So if it's 2 in the morning and you want to make a report, go ahead, but you're going to be up for a while. Um, you can call the Sheriff's Office or the Front Royal Police Department. They'll connect you with us. Or, April's favorite toy now, is the mandated reporter portal. Anytime, day or night, mandated reporters, which all school employees are, um, you can go to this website here, vacps.dss.reachini.gov, input your information electronically, it automatically populates to our inbox, and we get that referral immediately as soon as you hit send. You don't have to wait on the phone, you don't have to call anybody, you don't have to talk to anybody. You can put that information in, it comes right to us, then there's an electronic record that you make the referral. Or you can just stop one of us on the street and say, I'll say call Christy. So. <laughs> but that's not all we do either. We actually uh, are the only Department of Social Services in the Northern Region that has a community liaison department. Uh, you may know Michelle Smeltzer. Most people do. Um, she is our community liaison. She has two people in her office with her. And they provide resources to people who may not qualify for TANF, may not qualify for SNAP, but you still need some help. Uh, that's where Michelle steps in. She works with the, um, uh, the clergy in our community, uh, for, and they have funds that she coordinates. Um, she also provides referral services out. Uh, I tell our staff all the time, uh, nobody should ever come to social services and leave empty handed. Uh, I may not have a program that can help you. I may not have a way to solve all your problems, but you know what I can do? I can give you a box of food. I can give you a referral to a community agency that may be able to help you. Or the very least I can do is I can spend two hours talking with you and seeing what are some different ways we can help. Um, one of my favorite things to say is the only people who look forward to going to social services are the ones who work there. Everybody else is not one of their best days. And so we need to be there with support and giving you, make sure you leave with something. Michelle and her office, they coordinate with clients, colleagues, and agencies to improve program outreach. They oversee our food bank. We have our very own food bank in social services. It's limited, um, but we do have shelf-stable food that we give away. We're doing a food drive right now, so if you ever want to make a donation, there's a box right in front of our office. Please feel free to drop some stuff off, get the word out, because um, there's a big need in our community uh, for people who are homeless or people who don't have enough to eat. You see it every day with your students here in school, I'm sure. Kids come to school hungry all the time. Um, we help with that. Um, we also have the only job developer in the northern region uh, in Virginia in our employee. And by job developer, her only job is to work with people who are unemployed or underemployed or who just want a better job. You don't have to be a client. You don't have to be a TANF recipient, you don't have to have anything to do with anything. You can walk in off the street and say, I need a job. She'll sit down with you, she'll help you write a resume, she'll give you some job leads, she'll get on the computer with you and help you um, apply for a job. Um, we even have a limited clothes closet that if you need clothes for an interview, um, we'll make sure you have clothes to go on an interview. Um, no other agency, no other DSS has that. We're not here, so it's kudos to Warren County because they're the ones who saw this need. Um, so spread the word on that too. If you know somebody who needs a job or wants a better job, that's part of what social services is. You know, people helping people triumph over poverty. That's what we do, that's who we are, that's what we believe in. And we have lots of different programs that, <laughs> lots of different programs help you get there. Amy was just reminding me that we're hosting a job fair in association with the Salvation Army <coughs> uh, and, and, and Goodwill. And Goodwill. And, Goodwill. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is coming up next month, right? Yeah, it'll be at the Community Center. I'll try to send you that to Here in Front Royal, we hold two job fairs a year. We have about 30 to 35 employers show up. Um, many of them hire on the spot. We've had lots of people who showed up, gave their resume, got it, walked out with a job. Um, so local employers uh, do uh, come to that job for see if anybody is looking. Um, your seniors, uh, your kids, your 16 and up who want a job, 
Um, maybe it will work with them too. Uh, they can come to the job fair as well. Kids need jobs too nowadays. Um, and our job developer will work with them if they're interested. I would love to possibly talk with you all sometime about can she do some presentations in schools? Can she let the kids know that these services are out there? Um, we want to be a, a partner to you at the school. If all else fails, we have an app. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Warren County Resources app, but we have an app that you can download. Uh, the app at the Apple Store It's called Warren County Resources. You want to know how I can get help for a, an elderly neighbor who may need uh, somebody to come in and help with some housework. That's on the app. Uh, you want to know, um, are there any shelters in the area? That's on the app. Our Google app for Android, uh, it is currently being redesigned. We just got the bill for it today, so I'm hoping it's up and running. Um, so please go to your local you know, your app store. It's a free app. Download it, spread the word. Everybody should have this app. Every resource that we know of in Warren County is on that app. If there's one that you know that we don't, and it's not on the app, tell us and we'll get it on. That's all I have for you. Um, like I said, I brought the brains. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask us. I did bring some information that we'll get Christy to share with you. Um, the brochure on our services that we have. Um, I did bring also a resources on food resources. I had some more brochures that just disappeared. <laughs> So, uh, and if you have a question, you drive home and you're like, he's like, oh gosh, I wish I would have asked that. Um, Dr. Ballinger knows how to get a hold of me. Um, email, phone call, uh, we're always available and always happy to answer any questions. I just want to, I, I want to say thank you for the, the, the partnership that we have. And, and April, I know you've been to my, my, my uh, administrative retreats over the last three years, and so I, I, I do appreciate that, and, and just want to say thank you for the partnership. Yeah, we, we appreciate it a lot. We have common concerns, and you, know, you want what's best for children, we want what's best for children. We want everybody to be safe and happy and healthy. And it's great to have wonderful community partners who are moving in the same direction. There are kids too. When I worked in the field as a CPS investigator, I went to the school and one of the front desk ladies goes, thank you so much for caring about our kids. And I said, well, there are kids too. You know, they're all the same. And I was going to add that maybe we could reach more kids because they raise like the income limits for SNAP have, are gone up October 1st. So maybe we can reach more people who may not have been eligible before. Well, I hope that having you here tonight will be one way to reach more of our families about all the services that you do provide. Um, I mean, I think you gave a lot of good information that would be really helpful to a lot of our families. And I was just looking on our website, is there is there a clear link here to some of the resources that they offer? Is there a way to have that connection for our families? I mean, we can look at that. I don't know if there's a clear link. Um, I'm not easily finding yeah, it. A lot of that work goes through probably Tile and Para, um, Shamika's office. Uh, so, so they have those. You know, they're the ones making those connections with families and, and then making the connection with, with social services. So, um, I would need to get with with that office and see what they have. And then, you know, can we put some? Uh, yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Some of those applications is there a way to, you know, put that up there? Here's an application for. Support. So Just one more support. way for our families to find that contact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I will send Dr. Ballinger an email with links to all of the websites and a um, copy of all of our flyers that you can feel free to distribute far and wide to anybody you want. And the more people have the information, the better off we all have. Oh, I think that's wonderful. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Do you want us to go see that Yeah, that's it. And next up we have an instruction update and that's from Ms. Brad.
I just wanted to uh, use the instructional update time tonight to follow up on a couple of things I believe that were requested from the board. Um, first up is regarding uh, the textbook inventory that I just passed out uh, down the road there. Um, it's my understanding at the retreat session that the uh, board was interested in looking at what textbooks we have that have both online access and hard copy available to students. This textbook inventory is what is currently in place in primarily our core <coughs> subjects um, with the addition of world language at the bottom for this school year that have that uh, regarding textbooks that have been purchased since 2020. So this is kind of the current list for our core courses. Um, as you can see, we are heavy on student online access, and so that means that every student that's enrolled in those courses has online access to those digital textbooks, and then in uh, most places, we purchase some form of a hard copy textbook for uh, the student as well. So at elementary, those hard copy textbooks are individual. Uh, each student is getting both an online and a hard copy because a class set in elementary is every student having their own book. Um, and then at middle and high school, we typically tend to purchase class sets. Um, so that means that there's approximately, roughly 25 to 30 books you know, in a classroom Kids would have access to them. They're kept on. They're kept on the shelves to be pulled off during class use. Um, those can be loaned out, uh, usually in the form of like teacher keeping a record or something like that. If a teacher, if a student needs to take a hard book home, or if a hard uh, copy textbook needs to be sent home for um, like a homebound purpose or something, something like that. In the couple places where we don't have the hard copy book, specifically for middle school STEM scopes. Um, that program, STEM Scopes, is an online program only. Um, there, we did not purchase like a hard copy text, and it's designed to be used that way um, with, without hard copy. And it's the same thing for the Discovery Learning Earth and Space Science. They refer to their textbook as a tech <coughs> book, um, and so there's not a hard copy version available. Um, I will highlight the lack of history resources that you'll see on there that are new and what I would call like currently under contract. The last time uh, the county did a purchase for K-12 history was in 2010. Um, and at that time it was just hard copy books. You will find some use of those hard copy books throughout the classes, but it's not consistent. Um, the textbook adoption process for history was completed in 2018, but there was not funds to purchase the history textbook at that time, so there were no resources purchased. And history should come up for purchase again, potentially in the summer of 2025. As VDOE makes changes to how they've traditionally done their curriculum adoption, they're doing away with what you may be familiar with as the crosswalk years. They seem to be moving away from that. So we've had some shifts in when textbooks may come available. Um, it's gotten a little bit hard to predict exactly, just as you may know, the math standards, they've been moved up a year to go into full implementation by VDOE. So as VDOE is making some changes to how uh, curriculum is implemented in the school years, that will start to affect when our textbook adoption process comes up. But that's the most current data I have now. We would need to purchase for the summer of 2025 to be ready for new history standards in 25-26 if that doesn't change. Um, and I'll just use this as an opportunity to once again sort of lobby for replenishing the textbook fund. We were able to purchase the large bulk of these resources due to CARES funding. And CARES is why we were able to update our textbooks. So let's hope we don't have another pandemic. And, and you know, that's how we were able to use you know, our money to, to update our online resources and that sort of thing. Just so you know, kind of moving ahead. Um, this summer, 
For full implementation for 24-25, we'll be looking at purchasing supplemental and remediation resources for, to meet the Virginia Literacy Act. Um, we are planning on designating some of the all-in Virginia funds to help cover that. That's one of the acceptable uses. So that may be able to pick up that ticket item. In 2025, uh, that summer for full implementation in 25-26 will be history. Math also comes up for adoption that year. That's when our current contract runs out. And it's been my experience that, you know, we oftentimes will purchase a math book over a history resource, but history hasn't been supported since 2010. It's a long time. It's a long time. And I get it. I used to teach ancient history. How much has ancient history changed over the years, you know, in current times? Probably not that much, but that means they don't have an online resource. It doesn't have to be a textbook. It can be another resource that you know is more student friendly that the teachers prefer over a traditional textbook but you know our history courses are operating without kind of a division provided material they have the old textbook but that's that's what they got um, so math will come up in 2025 and we're projecting English to come up in 2027 and that's an expensive buy. so um, the textbook fund has been utilized this year. Um, you'll notice on the uh, science at high school, environmental science, it says purchase 10-23. I just signed the purchase order to purchase environmental science textbooks. Um, that was about $20,000 and that was, you know, that's for one high school class. Um, so uh, we've purchased French books this year. That was about $10,000 to uh, give support to our French class. Um, so, you know, the textbook fund at this time probably has about $30,000 in it once those science books come out, and $30,000 on a K-12 purchase won't get you very far. <laughs> so, again, just using this as an opportunity to let you know what's coming up. If you, you are interested, um, we can certainly provide something more comprehensive with our older books, um, but this is kind of what what we know is currently like sitting on the classroom shelves and being used. Some electives at high school, that sort of thing, those textbooks may go back even into the 90s. If you want something more comprehensive, you can certainly reach out to me and I can put it together, but I wanted to provide what I feel like is, is actually being utilized in the classroom and has been purchased in the recent past. Any question on textbook inventory? And I did write in for Algebra 2 and Geometry, the class set. I just forgot to, just, to drop that down, but those are class sets. Do you have any questions? And then the last thing that I mentioned is related to Chromebooks. And um, I'm doing this on behalf of our Interim Director of Technology, Doug Stefanowski, who couldn't be with us. Um, all students in SOL tested grades, so grades 3 up into high school, have a Chromebook with an operating system that will support TestNav and the testing software to do SOL testing on. Um, the sort of asterisk to this is Skyline High School. They have the Chromebooks, they just have not distributed them to the students yet uh, because we don't have enough chargers. So we had to order chargers to have enough chargers to match up with the Chromebooks at Skyline High School and as soon as those chargers arrive, those Chromebooks can be distributed to the students. So we're setting a goal of, you know, hopefully that'll be done by the beginning of November, that Skyline High School students have the Chromebooks and the chargers for them that they need. But um, we do have all students able to SOL test on a Chromebook in those grade levels. Non-SOL tested grade levels, so you know, your K to two, um, they do have a device it just may not support that operating system for, for uh, the testing software and the teacher Chromebooks will not support the testing software either. So it's just the student Chromebooks that have that operating system. Um, you know, the bottom line, we're okay on our Chromebooks for this year with expirations and things like that, but again, we need to start planning for the future and getting uh, think and having that discussion about what uh, technology purchases need to be made. 
Um, we don't have a lot of wiggle room, like if we would get you know an influx of, of students or something like that for this year, but we're, we're holding steady to get us through this year, but that planning for future technology per, per, uh, purchases and the money to support that needs, does need to be had. When, and, Doug, and I think the tech teams are working on some projections. Do you know that when they're um, assigned a plan book, like in third grade, and you might not know the answer, but are, do, are, is, does that follow them? Do they keep it like all third, fourth, and fifth? Do they turn it in at the end of every year, and then they're I know, think right now that's or? primarily the way it's done, is that they turn them in at the end of the year, and then they're reissued the following year. Um, actually, Doug mentioned that to me when I talked to him earlier today. You know, and he said it wouldn't bother him if you issued it at third grade and you carried it the whole way through, basically. Um, but there's just some different ways to do it, and I'm sure some of that has to do with just making sure that it's checked in and not lost over the summer. Right. So then it just kind of becomes the school's responsibility to get those ready to go for the next school year. So they essentially would get a new a, a Chromebook issued at the beginning of every school year. Yes. For three, grade three through 12. Yes. Yes, and like I say, K2 do, do have devices. Uh, Pre-K and K have tablets. One and two have devices. Um, they just don't support that testing software. Yeah. Yeah. For some reason, I was thinking like for my oldest son that he got one in, as a freshman and like he kept it through yep. his senior year. Yeah, I think some school Like he didn't get it. Like he didn't turn it in every year. Yeah. I mean, every summer. I, I couldn't understand. I think, I think you can issue with them that way. It's, I mean, it can certainly be done that way. You give them a new one at I mean, start grade and they carry it as long as, as, you know, as long as it's still working. Um, but right now, they're checking them in and checking them out each summer. Thank you. If you have any other questions about the textbooks, feel free to reach out. Um, let's let somebody go ahead and read us into closed session at this point, and then we'll take a five minute break or so. According uh, to the vote, no, 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 no sorry. <laughs> Um, this motion is made that this open public meeting of Warren County School Board become a closed meeting pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711. School Board desires to discuss the following matters in a closed meeting. Section 2.2-3711A1, discussion, consideration, or interviews of prospective candidates for employment assignment, appointment promotion, performance, promotion salaries, disciplining or resignation of employees of the school board, specifically the review of the October 18, 2023 personnel report and addendum and an employee personnel issue and section 2.23711A8. Consultation with legal counsel employee or retained by a public body regarding specific legal matters requiring provision of legal advice by such counsel, specifically advice regarding two legal issues. Nothing in this subdivision shall be construed to permit the closure of a meeting merely because an attorney representing the public body is in attendance or is consulted on a matter. Is there a second? A second? Mr. Valentine, do you need a roll call, please? Mrs. Lyle? Aye. Aye. Dr. Baum? Aye. Dr. Pence? Aye. Mr. Rinaldi? Aye. Mrs. Salins? Aye. Thank you so much.